Hi guys and welcome back. And today we are going to build the Bronco Kit, the Canadian 40mm Bofors anti-aircraft gun. This um, is the start of my next diorama which is uh, all centred around the uh, bombing of Darwin. So we'll just make a small change to this and rather than build the uh, pure Canadian version, We'll make the Aussie version of that. Now, these were produced in Great Britain and in Canada, and in fact in Australia, manufactured some of these guns as well as a, a number of um, spare barrels. And uh, there's lots of reference photographs, and I've shown some of those. There's no definitive standard set up, so some had front shields, some didn't, some were motorised, some were manual. The main reason I'm building this is because uh, my father served in Darwin during the war uh, on one of these guns, and I really just wanted to, and I've wanted to do this for probably 40 years, honour him by replicating the gun that he served on, and just doing a little scene reflective of the guys at rest, perhaps, prior to, prior to going into action. So just do a brief unboxing, and just still pictures really of the instruction manual, very clear, nice you know, line drawings, nothing overly complicated or difficult. There's some vagaries in some, in some places, but I think that would be uh, overly critical. What started to strike me as I got into the doing was there's a number of places throughout the instructions where they tell you not to glue, and there's, there's an expectation that there's a, a, quite a bit of movement in, in the number of the parts. And in some instances, and I'll cover that in more detail, particularly around the barrel connecting with the breech, it was poorly moulded to the point where you couldn't not glue it, so a few little challenges. Some colour call-outs, uh, pretty stock standard, and then get straight into the sprues. So in the main, I'd have to say that it uh, it was quite cleanly moulded. The sprues were all in pretty good condition, and not a great deal of flesh around at all. Good detail, lots of really tiny parts and I started to get a sense that this was going to be a bit tricky just as I was going through it I always like to go through the sprues and just compare them back to the instructions and the sprue map to make sure I know what I'm looking for when I start building. The decal is nice and crisp I probably won't use most of those and some good PE lots of little pieces which again started to make me worried I really love the uh, sights uh, beautiful detail there and then some tiny little I think wing nuts which are really small some ammunition there's some good extras with boxes and ammunition cases and some really fine parts like the air sight frame and as you see good rivet detail on the on the breech there so all in all I'd say nicely molded uh, interesting observation and completely irrelevant but the plastic was inconsistent so some parts were quite firm and other parts were quite soft and I couldn't understand why that was the case and this is even more irrelevant but when filing some of it it had the weirdest smell and I've never encountered that before so I'm not sure why that was but uh, I just thought it was uh, a bit strange. So on with the build and this is when I first started to suspect a degree of over engineering because uh, I don't mind five parts to a wheel if you get a spectacular looking wheel, but there was some fit issues and seams, a few gaps, so I, I thought that was a bit of an underwhelming start. And then uh, started onto the photo etch and started to realise then that there was uh, going to be a lot of little fiddly parts that needed to be bent into shape, and this was probably one of the easiest ones. And look, they look great, don't get me wrong, I, I think they look great, but uh, it became tedious as time went on, putting all these little parts together. So the gun platform starting to take shape. Some good detail, minor fit issues around the way, nothing horrendous, but just enough to, to make you scratch your head. And a lack of clarity in some of the instructions. So lots of small components in the sub-assemblies, uh, but you won't. You really do have to read through a f uh, forward a few steps to, to get a, a good sense of what they were going to attach to and, and that pointed out some issues there. So this was fun, these 5 mil long photo etch had to turn into these little rings which then got mounted onto the side of the gun carriage near the point where the spikes, the stabilising spikes go as well which were very difficult to get in place because they had to be 1.5 mil apart. A bit of seam on the barrel, now I'm, I'm old fashioned so I don't mind a bit of a seam on the barrel, I think you can sand it and polish it and it, uh, it doesn't come up too badly. Uh, it was probably the worst part of the moulding so lots of again parts in the sub-assembly for the gun barrel. My biggest issue with this was around the, the fit and the fact that the barrel was supposed to be movable. 
and uh, that wasn't the case. So just look into a little bit more detail on that with this video. So the biggest concern I had with the assembly here was this part at the back just wouldn't fit in properly at all and it should be forward and flush and the reason for that is is because the this assembly here which holds the uh, ammunition just physically couldn't fit forward any further there's just there was just no way you could do it and I think I just persevered in frustration so because I was annoyed that there was a seam and a gap at the top of the breech there where the barrel joins and the instructions clearly indicate that the barrel can move in and it says clearly in the instructions not to glue this part here but it just there was no way it would stay together it defied anything I could think of that would, would keep just gluing the two ends of the barrel together so that was frustrating and really I mean it just required a little bit of filling in and a little bit of trimming of the of the part at the end and I didn't care whether the gun barrel could recoil or otherwise but the instructions were uh, optimistically saying all that was possible so again started at this point to really get a sense of that their eyes were bigger than their stomachs they wanted to produce this really top class kit but there were just a lot of little things that weren't quite right and so for me, this was another example of the over-engineering. So the instructions would have you cut these little plastic, let's call them bolts, off the edge of the sprue as part of the sub-assembly here. Not difficult to do as such. Cut them off, I think I lost count here, somewhere along the line. I think I needed six and eight to show us how quickly I can count. It took a long time to figure it only had five. So you can cut them off easily enough, uh, there's no great danger. And then you have to stick them to the inside wall here. There's no guide points, it's uh, just by eye compared to the instruction. Really small pieces, very fiddly uh, and tedious to do. And again, in, in doing this I was looking at the instructions and thinking, well, you're not going to see these Anyway, and I guess this is an example of the over-engineering where this is, a for me, a part that these lugs could have already been in there. I understand why they're there. They're, they're to keep separation from the piece that goes um, inside uh, so it doesn't sit flush with the bottom. But surely these could have been moulded uh, in the one piece. And there's a, there's a number of little things like this. And again, as I, I think I said before, it's a first world problem, so uh, you love making kits. But uh, sometimes you wonder... Uh, at the design engineering and say, well, why would you why, why would you think of doing it like this and how does that add value? I enjoy seeing the kit come together. And I think maybe that's what frustrates me. These are not like a tank where where you see it sort of evolution. There's so many sub-assemblies in this that you, you start to wonder what you're building uh, after a while. And, uh, and I just couldn't pick that one up, could I? It uh, whizzed across the table. Uh, but eventually they're all in there. But yeah, it's just frustrating. So this assembly is pretty much the only one that I felt that I could film where my hands weren't obscuring putting on all the tiny parts. Uh, so this is just uh, the, the platform. Just a few little pieces. Uh, it was delicate with the plastic beams. Uh, this little piece, for example, which is a dial of some sort, no guiding point for where it goes, so you just have to follow the, uh, the position as it is on the, on the instructions. And I guess my overall feeling, and I hope I haven't come across too negatively throughout this, but uh, because the end result I think is, is quite good. But the process was quite tedious, and, uh, and I think that gets down to, you know, they'd, they've made six or seven parts in a sub-assembly, and, and you look at the finished result of the sub-assembly and think, well, that, that could have been one or two parts. And I'm not sure that adds value or pleasure to the, to the building. And even things like the platforms that I'm putting on now, uh, the guide holes for the for the location lugs were imprecise uh, or not not deep enough or not wide enough. So it just all those little extra bits that you have to do to to make sure it works. And some some people might be really into that and, and take great pleasure from it. And I'm afraid that's not my personality type. So my experience in the build was one more of frustration. And, uh, and partly too because it is such a delicate kit and you're more likely to knock bits off than um, keep them on. But as I said, look, the end result, this is it just prior to painting, really happy. It looks like a Bofors anti-aircraft gun and, uh, and I'd have to say that I give them full credit for that. So on with the painting and I'd kept everything um, 
in its separate parts in painting because I don't know exactly where I want it on the diorama platform. So I, I undercoated everything with a black primer and then went over that with a light grey primer. And then thought I'd try something a little bit different by base coating everything in the in the kit with a gun metal colour with just a, a little bit of black paint added to that. And the reasoning behind that was I wanted to do some chipping, uh, I guess the old fashioned way, by putting the uh, top coats on of the of the olive drab and then being able to gently remove where I wanted it removed to show the metal coming up through underneath. So I was reasonably happy with uh, how that went. So at the end of the day, it was really just a black primer with a grey primer and then all I did was spray the gun metal with a little bit of black. So I'd picked up Life Colors US Olive Drab set of uh, colors, and then forgetting I'd done that, I picked up AK's set of US Olive Drab colors. So I won't pretend I was smart and I bought two for a specific reason, but I used both of them. And the next little bit, the next three minutes or so, is just layer upon layer. And I really just started at the darkest color and used the dark shadow first and then progressively lightened it. And you'll see as it goes through, and I, w I will not talk through the, all of this, um, I just got further away at a very low pressure and at a, more, a steeper angle because I wanted to simulate, if I could, a, um, a gradual fading. You know, it's very hot in Darwin and very sunny, and uh, I figure it would have uh, bleached the, the paint. Now, that didn't necessarily come out brilliantly after I did the first wash. I think it was okay prior to doing the wash, but then after the wash, it had turned way too dark. And, and subsequently, I went back in and did another very fine spray of the highlights, which I think ultimately looks okay so I'll just leave you with a little bit of music and uh, all you're really seeing now is layer upon layer of progressively paler colors of the olive drab So I'm really sorry, but I lost a little bit of footage, and I'm not sure how I did that. But this is now after the first, after I've washed away, carefully wiped away with a cotton bud, some of the paint, and then a first wash with um, a acrylic wash and water, which I was sort of happy with, but um, I'm not. I didn't feel it had affected the exposed metal parts the way I was hoping it would. So. I then thought I would go back in again with a oil wash and mineral spirits. Now, that did two things. One, which got me mildly excited for a short period of time, and the other, which didn't make me happy at all, and I should have realized it would do this. So it darkened up the metal, but it darkened up the um, olive drab way too much as well. But the thing that I wasn't expecting, and I sort of got excited about it for a little while, was the effect that it had on the paint. And um, we'll have a bit of a close-up in a second once I've covered all of it with the wash. But because it had been exposed and um, well sealed, 
I got this blistering effect, which initially I thought, wow, that's fantastic. I, could, I just sort of thought of rust disease, and not so much for this model, but for other models. If you could, if you could replicate that, um, you could have a really interesting finish. Strangely enough, it only lasted for as long as the white spirit was active and you'll see over the next couple of photographs that it actually dissipated and and almost it just left a very faint patina so um I, but i have to do some more work on that because i think that could be really promising on a well rusted vehicle so ultimately this is the um the finished sort of weathering in terms of wiping off the surface levels of paint and and leaving exposed metal i will go back after this and clean up the the overall darkness And it was at this point, of course, that I realised I hadn't filled the um, the gaping hole in the wheels. So I filled that, let it dry, and, and my philosophy on filling anything is put as the least amount of filler in as you can, uh, so you have less chance of doing much damage when you're cleaning it all up. So I used the sharp edge here to follow the contour of the inner rim of the tyre, uh, and that worked fairly successfully and then with a very fine file sanded away from the rim and uh, that was only on the theory that the tyres probably more likely to be scuffed up at that edge than on the inner contour. I'd also tried to do some colour modulation there which didn't work out all that well for the for the metal part in the middle. It was darker and I don't think it comes up at all well here uh, but it's darker on the bottom than it is on the top just a matter of um, getting the black on and being very careful uh, but again I, my philosophy on this is you're as careful as you can be but if you get some on you can always you can always fix it you can always go back with a little bit of the olive drab and fix it but you want to do as little of that as humanly possible so all that will be weathered um, when everything's put together and then the very last thing I did was just a little bit of delicate um, rust effects very very understated because it shouldn't be a lot of rust on it but just look for the low points on any flat surface where i thought water might have or condensation might have gathered and and caused a, a little piece of rust and, and i didn't do very much at all and so that's basically it it's probably 95 percent completed i'm not doing the final weathering until i've got the dio base finished because I found when I did the Jag Panther one when I weathered the dio base separately to weathering the vehicle there was a mismatch so I'm going to get the dio base done and the final weathering on the gun and there's also a truck that will be going on and probably half a dozen figures so I'll build all the components and um, and the base and then do final weathering on everything at the same time so look in spite of the fact that it had some frustrations it, uh, I think, has come out really well, and I'm extremely happy with it. It's um, It's been quite challenging with all the fiddly little parts, but overall I think it uh, it was worth the effort, and I think it'll look good in the dio with uh, everything around it. So just a few still pics to show you some close-up detail, and then I'll come back and say goodbye. So thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I hope you enjoy this series uh, for the diorama on the bombing of Darwin, and uh, look forward to seeing your comments. If you're a first-time viewer, don't forget to subscribe so you can keep track of what's going on uh, in the series and in future series. Thank you all again, and take care. Goodbye.